Hello, everybody, and thanks for joining us. My name is RJ Witherow, and I'm the events manager here at Parnassus Books. Tonight, I am so excited to bring you a book that I really liked, A Little Bit Country by Brian D. Kennedy. Um, it is a debut novel, and we are extra excited because tonight, Brian is in conversation with local author Erica Waters. Just as a reminder, you can get a copy of A Little Bit Country at Parnassus Books. The link will be either in the Facebook comments if you're watching on Facebook or the YouTube description if you are watching on YouTube. Just as a reminder, Brian is taking questions from the audience tonight. So if you have any questions for the author, feel free to leave them in the comments for a chance of having them answered tonight. I am so thrilled now to turn it over to Brian and Erica. Thank you, RJ. Um, hey, Ryan. <laughs> I'm so excited to be talking with you about your beautiful debut novel um, that we are all so excited about, A Little Bit Country. Um, so I will, I guess, um, introduce you a little bit and let you talk a little more about yourself and your book. Um, so Brian, is a New Yorker, um, which I've never even been to New York, um, like literally have never stepped foot in New York City. So I'm a little intimidated by you fancy New Yorkers. Um, and Brian has written A Little Bit Country, which is a gay rom-com about two boys who fall in love at Wanda World, which is a um, country music theme park. And Brian, do you want to tell us a little bit more about the book? Sure. I would just, I would like to start by saying I'm so excited to be doing a book event here with Parnassus. Uh, and the way you feel about New Yorkers, I think I feel about uh, people from the South and maybe you, Erica, where I'm like, <laughs> oh no, like I would love to have a Nashville event with a Nashville author, but like, are they going to like me, like the city slicker? <laughs> so it goes both ways. Um, but yes, thank you. So my book is a little bit country. It actually comes out tomorrow. So this is our fun pre-release event tonight. It's as Erica said, it's about two boys who spend their summer working at a country music theme park owned by country legend Wanda Jean Stubbs. Uh, if you've ever been to Dollywood or if you're a fan of Dolly Parton, it might sound a little similar. And that may be intentional, but it's definitely, definitely fictional. There's no Dolly in here. Um, Emmett wants to be country music's biggest gayest superstar. And Luke, who is from the South, hates country music because he thinks it ruined his family's life. So, of course, they meet at the park and opposites attract. Yes, I had uh, the best time reading this book. So just for a little context, um, Brian and I are, um, we share a literary agent, uh, Lauren Spieler at Trianna US Literary Agency. Um, and I don't even know how it happened, but somehow um, we decided to exchange the manuscripts that we were working on in 2020. Uh, which for me was my second novel, The River Has Teeth, and for Brian was a little bit country. And so I was so lucky. I was one of the first people who got to read it when it was still a manuscript. Um, and it was during like the very early weeks of the pandemic when we were all terrified and didn't know what was going on. And so I was, I felt really lucky. I got to read this beautiful fun, funny, lovely um, romance novel that sort of took me outside of all of that fear and scariness. Um, and it was such a lovely thing to get to read in the early days of the pandemic. Um, and so I just, I don't know, I have a lot of love for this book. I think a little bit because of that, because I remember it as being this sort of um, soft place in the midst of a lot of scariness. Um, and unfortunately, poor Brian in exchange for his lovely novel, got my angry, monstrous, dark witches, you know, um, missing girls, <laughs> monsters and murder, <laughs> which, which was a, a little more in keeping with a pandemic, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Brian, tell us, how's your, how's your launch week going? This is your, like, first book how's it how's it all going it is it's it's been great uh i've had a couple of events now so actually my book was supposed to come out about a week ago and because of shipping delays it got pushed back um which was actually kind of worked out well because i had all these events planned for after my book came out and now it's been this like fun build up to finally it coming out and then i feel like maybe i can take a breath after that um yeah. since it's finally out there so you got to do an in-person event, right? I did. I did one here in New York. I work uh, at a community center called the LGBT Center, 
uh, part time for my day job, and we did a fun event uh, uh, in the evening for the book uh, last week. So it was, it was just you know you work on a novel so long, and it was finally like a moment to really celebrate it. And it was everything I wanted it to be, and it was I just felt so supported by all my friends and people I didn't even know that well who showed up. It was great. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, I um, am like such a pandemic author, like my first book came out in 2020. And I've yet to do an in person event ever. So I'm a little jealous of you, but fingers crossed that I will get to do one for um, yeah, so. for the restless dark when it comes out later this year. Um, okay, so let's just dive in. Do you want to give us a little taste of the book? Maybe give us a little reading? Sure. I'm going to do a very short reading. Uh, so this is a dual point of view novel. So each character gets uh, their own chapter. So I'm going to read from Luke's chapter. And he's uh, the one who is actually from this town of Jackson Hollow, Tennessee. Um, and I'm the only preface I'll give is that there are, I wrote lyrics for this book, and I'm going to read one of them. I'm not going to sing it. You do not want that. Trust me. Uh, but you'll, you can just imagine it being sung uh, when I get to that. <clears throat> After leaving her bedroom, I grab my work boots and head downstairs. Gabe's dirty dishes are on the table, and Amelia's still at the counter watching something on her iPad, which has a crack, crack running across the screen. Believe it or not, our next two performers grew up in the same small town together. And trust me when I tell you, Nashville's forever going to be indebted to Jackson Hollow, Tennessee for these pretty little ladies. I don't have to look over Amelia's shoulder to know who the announcer is talking about, but I can't help myself. If you've tuned, in, tuned into any of our shows recently, you'll surely recognize our first guest. Lady and gentlemen, please welcome Miss Wanda Jean Stubbs. The audience applause as a woman with about 10 pounds of bright red hair piled on top of her head walks out. She's wearing a purple jumpsuit with sparkly rhinestones running down the legs. Even without the stage lights, you can tell she'd brighten any space she was in. And making her grand old Opry debut tonight is a name that I believe will soon be just as popular. Folks, put your hands together for Miss Verna Rose. A petite woman with long blonde hair joins her. She's wearing a white jumpsuit with pink roses stitched into it. The two women take a second to smile at each other before holding up their long skinny microphones to sing. Mama made it look so easy as she tied a bow in her apron strings. But what Mama never told us is that being someone's wife comes with a list of things. The dishes need washing and the pork needs roasting. Shirts can't iron themselves and that party needs hosting. Your legs need shaving and your hair needs dyeing. Makeup ain't cheap and, oh no, is that the baby crying? It ain't always pretty, but we do what we can because when you're a woman, you got to keep a smile on your man. Yeah, if you want to be a woman, you got to keep a smile on your man. Oh, and I want to end that by saying, I know that doesn't sound like a very feminist song, but that's intentional. Uh, it's sort of styled after sort of the old cool old school country songs that women had to sing and that was that video was like from the past right like it was yeah it's like from the 60s or 70s yeah okay yeah okay so all right well first of all I, here's here's my burning question which is how did someone who is from minnesota and currently lives in manhattan get into country music exactly <laughs> um that is a fair question because growing up, I did not listen to country music. I did not like country music. I thought it was probably like country and metal were the two that I just was like not interested in at all. And then in my early 20s, uh, I finally came out as gay. And I think I could be a little more open about like maybe what I liked and what I listened to. And I, I like things that tended to be a little over the top and campy. So of course I was naturally drawn to Dolly Parton. Mm -hmm. And I always say that Dolly was sort of my gateway to country music because at first I was just so drawn to like her appearance and how fun she seemed. Um, but then I started to listen to some of her earlier albums. And in the like early aughts, I think she had three bluegrass albums come out that I just like fell deeply in love with. And that's like, it opened up this whole new world with me where I was like, oh my God, this is what country music is. Like, this is amazing. I want to know all about this. So from Dolly, I I just never turned back, like I never looked back. I just, now like country is pretty much the only thing I listen to. Okay, wow. <laughs> okay, so what, like obviously country music and your love for Dolly Parton was a big part of why you wrote A Little Bit Country, but like, is there like an origin story or like this particular thing that sparked your idea for the book? 
Yeah, you know, I mean, obviously Dolly was an inspiration and I always thought it'd be fun to write a book in like a theme park setting. And if I was obsessed with wanting to go to Dollywood, uh, so I thought, well, that would be a fun place to write it. But I actually have to say like, when I first started thinking about this, I was like, well, if this is going to be a book about country music, like it probably should be a straight romance because country in general is very, at least the people who are like gatekeeping the industry are very, they want straight musicians and straight acts. I was like, well, that's what it should be. And then thankfully someone in my writing group, my friend, Michelle was like, well, why can't it be gay? Like, why does it have to be straight? I was like, well, cause that's just the way it is. She's like, yeah, but you're the author. Uh, and then, so like once, she sparked that idea. I was like, all right, now I know exactly what I'm writing about. I'm writing about how country music can and should be gay because it's music for all people, not just the one audience that they're trying to sell it to. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm glad they gave you that idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so I get why you love Dolly. You love kind of the camp and the appearance. And then what else? What else is it about Dolly? Because you are the like biggest number one Dolly fan that I've ever met. And I have lived in the South for my entire life. So like, what is it about Dolly that does it for you? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot to love. I think originally it was, it was her music uh, that I fell in love with. Cause so what I love, like she has written over like 3000 songs and I just think she's like a genius songwriter. A lot of her earlier works, this, she does like story songs where it's not necessarily about something that happened to her but it tells a story which I think is very intriguing to listen to. Like it actually makes you listen to the lyrics and not just the music. Um, I love her voice. It has like that perfect like Southern twang to it, but also it can kind of veer into pop and it's very bright. Um, she is a philanthropist who like does a million good things. Like what's not to love about that? And then I, I think it's just, there's something magical about her. Like I know that sounds so cheesy to say, but she's someone who, I know she doesn't have like a big acting career, and she would probably be one of the first people to say she's not like the greatest actress, but like when she is on your screen or on the TV or your phone or whatever, like you just have to watch her. Like she just has that something in her that just draws you right into her and you and you just can't take your eyes off her. So it's yeah. all of that mixed together that I love. She is really magnetic. Um, so I, as I told you, like listen to Dolly all day to kind of, you know, get into the mood for tonight. Um, and so I was listen as I was listening to so many of her different songs, I was kind of thinking, okay, well, what is my favorite song of hers? Like, what's, you know, the one that I like will always love. And it's, I feel like in some ways it's so basic because it's everyone's favorite song, but I think for me, it's Jolene, which can we, can we admit that Jolene is a little bit of a gay song? Like it totally is like it's dying to be converted into like a sapphic romance novel. Yes. Like she's 100%. really just like, in love with Jolene a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, but what is your favorite Dolly song? Yeah, so I'm, I'm always prepared for this question because people want to know, and I still have a hard time answering it because I have a hard time like picking like a definite, like, yes, this is my favorite because there's I love them so much, all of them, um, but it's usually a tie between Jolene and I Will Always Love You. Mm -hmm. And I think if I had to have to have to pick one, it would be I Will Always Love You. It's just such a beautiful song. It's really bittersweet, which I like. And there's a whole backstory to it that's kind of beautiful. And yeah, it just, it just hits all, all the right spots for me. But I will say like Jolene, that opening rift and Jolene, like how can you listen to that and not be like, this is the best thing I've ever heard. So that's why it's hard to, to say I only have one favorite. So do you have, do you, is there a Dolly Parton song that you would say like, captures the essence of your novel like of a little bit country yes i would say there's three and i apologize for anyone else who's heard me discuss this already uh so i would say the first one uh at the beginning of the book uh emmett and luke kind of had their own things going on emmett one is so focused on his career and luke isn't actually out at the time so he's very protective of himself so they're not looking for romance so the dolly song i would pick is a, a song called why'd you come in here looking like that <laughs> and it's not like this. in the music video it's like this hot guy walks into the bar and always like why'd you come in here looking like that yeah um because it messes everything up uh, <laughs> and then for the middle of the book where you know they're sort of discovering the relationship and it's they're very much into each other i would pick islands in the stream which is dolly's duet with kenny rogers because it's a very like happy poppy love song that just puts you in a good mood when you listen to it and then for the last one i uh, you know you can't have a book without some conflict. So things get a little rocky between the two boys towards the end of the book. 
but hopefully at the end, no spoilers, they grow and learn from that experience. Uh, and the song I would pick from that of Dolly's is um, Light of a Clear Blue Morning, which is again, one of my favorite Dolly songs. Yeah, oh, that's great. Okay, okay. Um, so I don't know if you've talked about this in any of your other events, but like what does kind of the state of country music, like are there many queer artists that you are aware of? Like, are there, is, it a, is that something that's growing? I, yeah, I think like maybe within, I wanna say the last couple of years only, I think other people are starting to break in, which is long overdue. Um, as I said before, the gatekeepers sort of tailor towards one audience, which is usually cis and usually white and usually straight and usually even male, like female artists don't get a lot of radio play. Um, but I think over the past couple of years, other people have snuck in and are sort of opening doors, but they're coming in through different channels. So like, I love uh, Little Nas X. Uh, who's Black and who's queer. And I think if I'm remembering this correctly, he broke in through Spotify, like he put his music on Spotify and it just became so huge that suddenly everyone wanted it. And mm -hmm. a lot of people would argue that he's not a country artist, which I would disagree. Um, but he had this song, Old Town Road, which is just very fun and very addictive <laughs> to listen to. Um, and yeah, I just, like when I watch him, he just looks like he's having so much fun. And I think he really shook things up for a lot of people. And there are other, there are, country artists who are queer who have been along for been around for a while and just haven't gotten any attention because that's just the way the industry is set up. But I, I think new people are coming and and also opening doors like uh, Orville Peck is one. And then Brother Osborne's one of those singers came out as gay recently. So it's I think it's starting to happen more, which is great. Yeah. And I hope it continues. Yeah. Do you know um, Adeem, the artist? I that sounds familiar. I don't know them well, obviously. I just started listening to them this year. So they're a uh, genderqueer um, country artist. Um, like, I think their most popular song is probably um, Cast Iron Pansexual, <laughs> which I love. I love because, that. Okay, so you know, like when I wrote Ghostwood Song, I listened to nothing but bluegrass and folk and old time, like, because that's what the book revolved around. And I listened to so much of it that after a while I kind of couldn't take anymore, you know, like I just, I was immersed in it for like two or three years. And so every time I see someone who's doing something a little bit different or a little bit new around the edges of country music, I get excited because I'm like, okay, here's something totally fresh. Here's someone bringing a new perspective to, you know, this music that, that I've been listening to my whole life. Like, you know, so I don't know, it's, it's exciting to see queer people starting to make inroads, I think. Definitely. Country yeah. music. Okay, let's talk about uh, writing a little bit because I know we could both talk about country music yeah, like, for night. the entire time, but I'm sure some people would love to hear a little bit more about your your writing process, what getting this book published was like. Um, do you want to tell us a little about your publication journey? Sure. So I would say the journey to be published was very long and then very short, like very mm -hmm. slow and then very fast. So I think it was probably like 10 years ago when I officially was like, okay, I think I really want to try to become a published author. Like I've, I've always loved writing. And as a kid, I did a lot of writing. I did playwriting in college. And then finally in my thirties, I was like, okay, I'm actually going to pursue this for real. And um, so from then it was a long time and, you know, writing my first book, find, finding what genre or what age category I wanted to write in. Um, so I was trying out different things, wrote my first book, getting an agent, trying to sell a book with her. And all of that was, you know, a very long process, which it was to be expected. Um, and then with this book, so the book I signed my agent with, we didn't sell that. Uh, it went on submission. We, we put it out to editors. Uh, and it had a very slow, painful journey. Uh, and then when I started writing something new, uh, my agent approved this pitch for the country book. And once we put that out on submission, it sold much faster than I had anticipated, mm -hmm. um, which was great, obviously. But then it was sort of like this roller coaster ride of like, okay, now this is all happening. And for people who don't know, who aren't as involved with publishing, you might not know, like once you sell your novel, it's usually still about, I don't know, 16 to 18 months, if not longer before it actually publishes, because you have to edit it with your editor, and then they need to take time to print it and work on the marketing and publicity. 
But even though I think for me, it was actually like 22 months from when I sold it to when it's coming out now. And that sounds like a long time. And I think in the beginning, maybe it felt like a long time, but you're working on edits, you're working on your next book, you're working on promo, you're doing so much that it just, I feel like I blinked and now suddenly my book is coming out tomorrow. Yeah. How does it feel? It's good. I I feel like I'm already in the swing of things a little bit because I have been doing some events and and like I went uh, and signed some copies at a bookstore for the first time. A few people have texted me photos from from bookstores that it's already out on the shelves at. So it feels like it's I've already eased into it and then tomorrow's the big day. So I don't know. I feel like I'm mm -hmm. this is kind of a nice way to do it where it's like gradually and not just like boom all at once. Yeah. Okay. So what is what what are you like as a writer like are you a pantser are you a plotter do you like drafting do you like revision kind of what kind of writer are you uh i'm a i'm a slow writer first of all <laughs> very slow um i'm definitely a a plotter like hardcore plotter so a, a pantser if anyone's not familiar with that term it's where you sort of just write the book as you go you're flying by the seat of your pants you don't necessarily know what's going to happen until you write it uh, that doesn't work so well for me. I know it works well for some people, but I, I like to know, at least have my beginning pretty clear and my ending very clear, and then figure out everything that's going to happen in between then. And it doesn't mean I have to stick to it once I actually start writing. I am actually, I'm actually pretty loose and open with letting things change if I discover things that work better or are more fun. But it, it definitely helps to sort of have like those training wheels of like, okay, this is the direction the story should be heading in to sort of keep me on track. Um, and then as far as revision and drafting, if I'm drafting a book, I'll tell you I like revisions better. And if I'm revising a book, I'll tell you I like drafting better. Okay. Go what about you? <laughs> you have, you have preference? Uh, I love drafting. I think it's fun. Like I'm telling myself a story. I know like some writers hate it because it's like the terror of the blank page. Um, but I really love it. Like it's so fun. Revision feels like work to me. Like it's, 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 exhausting and like I know it's where the magic really happens and where the book really becomes itself you know but it's the part of writing that actually feels like oh yeah this is a job not just like a fun yeah. thing I get to do you know but I, I think that's why I like revision because I'm like I'm a Virgo so I'm very like like to-do list oriented and like revising I can like cross things off my to-do list where you're right when you're drafting Although it is fun and magical to create a story, I am often overwhelmed by like mm. that blank page and like not knowing what's going to happen next. So yeah, <laughs> maybe you should like trade some time. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> so for this book, like, did the process go pretty smoothly? Like, or like the like, let's say your first draft against the book that is in stores today. How different are those? I would say they're actually pretty similar. Um, I feel like. The first phone call I had with my editor, it was, we were just like on the same page from the beginning. In fact, it was so great because she was like, because I, I had asked her like, you know, what what sort of in, what sort of uh, revisions do you have in mind for this? And she was like, she was like, well, I think between chapter four and five, we need to add another scene there. I was like, I actually cut a scene there before we sent this to you. So like she could tell what the story needed already. And we didn't have to like, at least the structure of a change much. I mean, we did a lot of work on it, but I would say the biggest difference is I tend to like overwrite my beginnings. I'm very into like, cause that's when I'm getting to know my characters. So I put in like unnecessary backstory and other things. Mm -hmm. I always end up like squeezing the beginnings to be shorter. And then when I get to the end in drafting, I'm usually rushing cause it's taken me so long. So like when I'm working with my editor we really stretch the endings out and make sure that everything feels like earned by the characters. Yeah, okay. So, okay. Not only did you write the novel, but you had to write all the songs. Like there are several songs in the book. So are you a musician? No? Okay, so how'd you go about writing these songs? Like, did you draw inspiration from somewhere? Uh, yeah, so I played band in high school and that was the end of my musical career. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm definitely not a singer. Um, but yeah, I figured a, a, a book like this needed lyrics. Uh, and the way I sort of went about writing them is I watched like some YouTube tutorials by other young songwriters who sort of like, or by like teachers who sort of just gave me like the very first basic steps of like how to write a song. So I just learned a little bit about it that way. 
And then I just studied a lot of uh, lyrics of artists that I like. And obviously it didn't copy them, but sort of tried to find their essence or style a little bit. So like the one I read tonight the, uh, from the reading, that was, to me, that felt like a Loretta Lynn song. So there, there were some where I could be like, okay, this is like a song from the 60s. And then Emmett, who wants to write his own music, I picked like, okay, what would what would a song that like Casey Musgraves write sound like? And like, I would read her lyrics and and they were a lot of work. Like those were, every time I reread my manuscript, I could not read those without like wanting to tinker with them again. Mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to, I don't know, to make them like as perfect. I, when you have such little space and you want to pack so much in there, it's really hard to make them shine the way you want to. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So I want to remind uh, people who are who are who are joining us um, that you can ask questions, put your questions in the chat, and uh, Brian will answer as many of those as he can uh, toward the toward the end. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about. I feel like we haven't even talked about the book very much yet. We've been like all these other things. So okay, Luke and Emmett are your two main characters. Um, which of them did you relate to more? Like, did, is one of them? Does one of them feel a little more familiar to you than the other? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I definitely relate to them both. I think just from like a geographical standpoint, I'm definitely more in line with Emmett. So he's from Chicago. And actually one of the things he has to grapple with in the book is he feels kind of like an outsider or like he's he's being fake by being from the Midwest and wanting to be like this country music artist. Um, but so I definitely share that geography with him and then just his passion for country music. Like he's kind of a spaz about it. Um, so like all my knowledge about it, I just poured into his mind um, and, and can really relate to, to his love for the genre. Um, and then Luke, you know, like we've said, I'm obviously not from the South. Uh, and it, it was something I was worried about trying to write a character who, is, who would be from that world. Um, which is like why I had Erica read my manuscript. Not that it's her job to fix it, but I was just like, <laughs> if there's anything you would want to point out that is totally inaccurate or like other things, even like things, I think you gave me some things to think about, which was great. You're like, you know, consider these things that someone from the South would be thinking about it was really helpful. Um, but where I related to Luke was sort of uh, on an emotional level. Uh, mm -hmm. So I grew up in like the eighties and nineties in Minnesota in I wouldn't say conservative, but, you know, was, I was raised Catholic and queer issues weren't addressed a lot. And I, I was in the closet till I was in my early 20s. And I was very protective and very guarded about all of that, which Luke is in the book. So I definitely felt a connection to him in that sense that I, I knew what he was feeling and thinking. Yeah, I definitely, I think, related to Luke the most, too. Like, I, I felt like he was just so well written and he felt really familiar to me um yeah so i think i think you did a really great job with luke's character um, even as a non-southerner <laughs> um okay so let's talk about what what do you think like without being spoilery favorite scene you wrote in the book like is there one you can share yeah, so, well, first I'll say, um, so Wanda Jean Stubbs, she's sort of the Dolly Parton stand-in. She was the most fun to write. So any scene she's in, I just had so much fun with it. And that's where I was like not afraid of the blank page because I just had so much knowledge of like what Dolly would sound like. So here's my character who's slightly different because mm -hmm. like I said, she has red hair. She's not a blonde. <laughs> um, here's here's how she would act in that, in that situation. Here's how she would talk. Her dialogue was really fun for me. Um, but as far as like a scene that was my favorite, uh, the first time Emmett and Luke hang out, I, I call it a date. They're not really sure if it's a date, but it's the first time that it's just two of them. And I just thought like, gosh, like what would they do in a small town in Tennessee on a, like a warm summer night and just sort of went with it from there, like all these romantic ideas that I have that, and I know not all of them are accurate, but like about like a, a summer night in the South, like what would, what would they, how would that affect them hanging out together in that space and just really played that up as much as I could. Yeah. Is that the one where they go to the, is it like 
a, is it like a river? Yeah, they well, they go to like an old grist mill, an abandoned yes. grist mill, and there's a river, and yeah. Which is 100%, I think, kids in a small southern town would, would do. Absolutely. <laughs> there aren't that many places to hang out in small southern <laughs> towns. <laughs> Okay, um, so all right, I think let's go ahead and take some questions from the audience. Great. I want to make sure we get to these. Okay, so um, well, someone asked where I'm from. <laughs> I'm from Lake City, Florida, which is in rural uh, north central Florida. Uh, so hello, uh, fellow Floridian. Okay, um, Brian, what pieces of yourself are in this book and these characters? And I already asked, do you identify more with one character versus the other? But do you want to talk about some of the pieces of yourself you put into the book? Yeah, so one thing, I mean, I think with every character I write, there's going to be something of me in there. Um, so one of my favorite characters to write besides Wanda Jean was Emmett's aunt, Aunt Karen. And she's sort of this like, free-spirited adult who very much is very supportive of her nephew. Uh, and I don't think I share the same experience as her, but like that's, this is gonna sound weird to say, but like if Emmett and Luke were real people, like she's who I would, that's how I would wanna treat them the way she treats them. Uh, so I guess in that way, I put kind of myself and her. Uh, and then the other thing, so Emmett wants to be, like I said, uh, a musician. And it was funny because when I was writing this, I was like, oh gosh, am I just writing like an, an allegory or like a metaphor for what it's like trying to become a published writer? Because Emmett <laughs> has to go through all the same struggles of like, he's trying to get uh, a music like rep to listen to him and like he can't get his emails returned or like phone calls or like doesn't know if he'll ever hear from him again. Um, and he's like putting YouTube videos up of him singing and the sort of comments he gets from that. So it's very much that struggle of like going after some, going for like a creative uh, career and sort of the pushback and the the highs and lows of that that I could relate to Emmett, even if mine was publishing and his was music. Yeah, the the creative pursuits can be brutal. <laughs> They're just roller coasters nonstop. Okay, um, someone asked, have you been to Dollywood yet? Any favorite amusement park experiences? So I, I did go to Dollywood. I, I had, like I said earlier, I was obsessed with it. I always wanted to go. I said I would go before, before I turned 40. So for my 40th birthday, while I was in the middle of drafting this book, I decided it was time. I treated myself and dragged my poor husband along <laughs> to our first Dollywood trip. <clears throat> And we, I mean, my husband, he's not a country music fan, but he's very supportive and he's a good sport. Uh, and he has to listen to me play a lot of Dolly, um, but he likes theme parks. So we we went, we spent two days at Dollywood and then one day sort of walking through the mountains a little bit and exploring other parts of town. And we had a great time. Um, and it was weird to like, I mean, obviously, like I said, my, my book's not an exact replica of Dollywood. There's a lot of similarities, obviously, uh, but it was weird to sort of, have this fictional idea in my head of what everything looks like and then to walk through a space that is so similar to that it felt like I was like literally walking through my book which was like yeah. fun, but weird um and yeah it, it was great my favorite ride there I I don't do I went on a bunch of roller coasters and I forgot that I don't do well on roller coasters because I start to get nauseous <laughs> um but the the uh Dollywood Express which is the old steam engine train that runs, I think it's like five miles around the park. And it's, it was actually used, I looked this up online in like World War II as transport, um, but it's just, it feels so appropriate to just be riding around a train uh, on the outside of the park. It was yeah. so fun. Okay, fun. Have yeah, you, I, you been, Erica? I haven't been. So the truth is that I hate amusement parks because I don't like being around a lot of people and I don't handle the heat well. So I'm just going to, if I ever get a, an, a hankering to go to Dolly World, I will just read your book again and <laughs> experience it vicariously through you. <laughs> okay, um, so this question is for both of us. Uh, do you think you have found your forever home in YA? Or do you think you'll ever feel called to write in other genres? What do you think? I mean, for now, I would say yes. Like, so what I love about YA, first of all, so I'm, I'm someone who needs like a lot of time to process something. So I don't think I could write a book about what it's like to be 30, probably not even what it's like to be 20. Like I need a lot of distance uh, before I feel like I have something to say. So for me, writing about 
teenagers, like that's an age group where I'm like, okay, I've lived that. I've had enough time to think about it. I can explore that world more and have interesting, hopefully interesting things to say. Um, and also I just think for me, because in my teenage years, like I said, I was closeted. So I, I sort of like my emotional growth at that time was really shut down and I didn't want to process things and I couldn't be like honest with myself about things. Uh, so I think I'm just catching up to that, honestly, like spending all this time because yeah, just writing about teenagers and giving them the opportunity to, to feel things that I couldn't because I didn't, I didn't know how to at the time. So that's why mm -hmm. I love YA and I can't see myself leaving it. But what about you, Erica? I love writing YA. Actually, I feel a lot, of, a lot of the same things about YA that you do. Um, like I, I feel like I also take a long time to process things and like, so writing YA for me, like is really cathartic. And I also didn't come out until my early twenties. So it is sort of like YA is a little bit of like reclaiming experiences I didn't get to have, I guess, um, or just sort of recasting childhood and, and adolescence in a different way. Um, I love writing YA. I think you can do a little bit more in YA sometimes than you can in adult fiction. Um, however, I, I do want to write outside of YA. Like I have a middle grade book I um, have drafted um, and I have a, an adult novel that I have plotted out that I'll be writing like whenever I get some time to write it. Uh, it's an adult horror novel. So I kind of want to write across the spectrum. Um, but I will say that like right now, YA feels the most comfortable and it comes the most naturally and, and the most easy to me. Um, but I definitely do want to branch out too. So we'll see if I manage to do it or not. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, what are some YA books coming out that you're excited about? Oh man, I could go on forever. Uh, I'm so glad I'm sitting here because I have props with my bookshelf. Um, all right, so I'm crazy about this book. It came out earlier this year, All That's Left in the World by Eric J. Brown. Uh, it's kind of, I call it uh, The Walking Dead without zombies and gay. Uh, that's kind of why Eric wrote it because he was watching The Walking Dead. And I know, I think they have gay people on it now, but in the first couple of seasons, they didn't. He's like, where are all the gay characters? What would they be doing? So it's two boys who are sort of living in a post-apocalyptic world uh, who they're strangers and they come together and try to survive. And it's so good. Um, I love it. Can't recommend it enough. Uh, some other ones that I just picked up that I haven't read yet that I'm excited about are uh, Lesbiana's Guide to Catholic School by Sonora Reyes. I love this cover. Kings of Beemore by R. Eric Thomas and Love Radio by Ebony Liddell. So those are some, I feel like I don't have a lot of free time to read right now, uh, just got the books up. But once I do have that, I'm gonna dive into those. Mm -hmm. What about you, Erica? What's on your list? Uh, so I've read some really, really good books. None of, I've been reading them all on NetGalley as eBooks though. So I don't have any lovely covers to show you. Um, but one that's coming out, I think in a couple of days is uh, Hell Followed With Us by Andrew Joseph White, uh, which is a uh, dystopian um, kind of horror novel um, with uh, trans boy as the main character. And it's so, good. It is dark, uh, kind of gory, fast paced. And it just, it's, I, I don't even have words for it. Like I just, at the end of it, I was like, yes, this is a book we need. So I really would, I'll say it again, since I can't show you the cover. Um, it's hell followed with us I by Andrew it, Joseph White. Uh, I think it comes out tomorrow actually. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So go, go by hell followed with us. Um, it is really, 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 really good. Um, okay, let me see if there's any other questions from the audience. I know we're getting a little short on time. So, okay, River asked, um, if you could have readers take away one thing from reading this book, what would it be? I think, so this book, I sort of, what I wanted to explore was like how to be your authentic self and how that looks different for other people. Uh, so like I said, Emmett, is very out and Luke is not out yet. Um, and, but I think there are still ways to be your authentic self, no matter where you are in that journey. So I would love it if readers could, could know that wherever you are, there's no timeline and there's no right way to do it. Like you, the, the right way to do it is the way that works for you. Yeah. 
Good, thank you for that. Let me see if I, I, don't, I wanna make sure I didn't miss any questions from anyone. Okay. Uh, all right, so I think we've hit all the questions from the audience. I apologize if I did miss anyone. So I guess, you know, I think it's hard to, like, I wanna, I wanna, I want this to be so celebratory because it's this amazing moment, like your book's coming out. But I think too, like talking about queer books right now, it's hard not to mention the atmosphere of, dread we're living in with the book bannings and um a lot of legislation coming out you know like don't say gay and all of that stuff i guess do you do you feel like your book has taken on more importance for you or does it feel like it's more weight kind of how does it feel coming having a book coming out in this atmosphere yeah i mean obviously it's something i think all queer authors are thinking about right now um, and it feels frustrating because we obviously want to do something and it's kind of hard to figure out like what that is, what we can do. But I, I mean, I honestly think like to keep writing our books, like to keep yeah. putting them out there. And I think what I'm most proud of about my book coming out is that it is a book that celebrates queer joy. I think it's important to have stories that, you know, deal with trauma and hardships. And there are, are a few like heavier themes, uh, underlying heavy themes in my book, but it's really, at least what I hope it is, is very joyful to read and celebrates queerness and the different ways to be queer. Um, so that's that's what I would hope. That's That's how I feel about it. I think you've definitely succeeded in that. It's pure joy. Thank you. All right, so one last question uh, as we close out. What's next for you? Do you have another book coming out? Can you, is there anything you can talk about yet? Yes, so I have another YA rom-com that will hopefully be coming out next summer. Uh, I can't really share many details yet, but what I've been saying is that it's another book that deals with music. It's not country music. Uh, it's a different kind of music. And if you read the back of my bio on my book, you might be able to figure it out. Okay, <laughs> great. Well, thanks. Thank you, Brian, for celebrating your beautiful book with us. And thank you to Parnassus for having us. Um, uh, you can, to everyone joining us in the audience, you can um, order Brian's book uh, from Parnassus. Brian, any, anywhere else you'd like to, anything else you'd like to tell them? Like, is your pre-order thing over? Uh, actually, if you order tonight from Parnassus, you can still submit uh, for my pre-order campaign. I'm giving away a really cool uh bookmark that it sorry it's kind of small but this is a photo strip photo booth strip of Emmett and Luke and I made a bookmark out of that and there's some stickers that have my Wanda Jean sayings on them uh so if you go to my social media handles I have a link tree there and you can click on the button to submit your receipt and I will mail you that fun book swag all right any any final words for us before we close out for the night? No, I would just love to thank Parnassus again and to thank you like like I said before doing in a, a, a Nashville event is it feels so special and to have it the night before my book comes out is just makes me so happy so thank you Erica yay well I hope you have an amazing book release tomorrow and wow we're excited your book exists in the world thank you 